worst weather outing. It's Sunday at lunchtime and my planned leaving time is Monday evening at about 8 o'clock p.m. So I'll be fairly confident in the, the forecast for tomorrow evening and the next day, particularly when the models line up as, as well as they do. So we're looking at the CMWF forecast here. So Monday at 8 p.m. you can see in Baltimore there's going to be very, very light winds. So I do expect to be motoring for the first while. So this is... Uh, 7 a.m. on Tuesday morning, the stronger wind begins to fill in. From here on in, really, should be on a kind of a broad, broad reach on the starboard tack. It does get a little, little windy there at times, but 24 knots is the maximum, and we'll have a look at the maximum gusts now in a minute. So this is Tuesday evening again. Be reasonably confident in the forecast, and they do line up fairly well. If I just switch this to the GFS, you can see that that's very, very, very similar to the CMF. So as we go onwards, the reason for leaving Monday rather than Tuesday in the good wind is that this ridge of light air sort of moves in over Biscay. And my goal is to try and be on the, the windier side of it by then. So I may well steer along rather than what this is saying to do for ECMF. I may, I may just continue to head south and or even stay slightly inshore. This, all of this is deeper than the, the, the Biscay shelf. So a little bit more motoring there towards the middle part and then obviously this far out, you know, this five, four or five days from now, I have less confidence in the forecasts. If we switch to GFS and see what GFS says, you know, GFS, GFS forecasts good wind the entire time, but I have slightly more faith in the ECMWF, uh, which is forecasting this light, light wind ridge. So according to all the forecasts then in the second half, I'll just switch to GFS and you can see it's forecasting good, strong, 20, 18 knot breezes there. And that's the GFS is forecasting uh, 18, 19 knots when I get to Finisterre, but the ECMWF is forecasting lighter, lighter conditions to fill in. There. Again, this is so far away, this is now Saturday next week, so it's six full days away and I'd have a lot less confidence in that, obviously. However, the models do broadly line up in terms of what they're expecting. So just have a look at the tables. The summary of that is, according to the ECMWF, I'll be motoring for 16 hours, 24 minutes, most of that towards the start and that little bit to get across that ridge in the middle. So leaving tomorrow evening at 8 o'clock and arriving Saturday at 5 o'clock. So if I, if I look like that's going to be delayed, I may have to slow down and push it out to the following morning to come in, in in the daylight hours. Although I do think Camarines yes, does look relatively approachable at night, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. If I'm not gonna make that, I will wait till the next day. So that's a passage of four, four days, 21 hours and 12 minutes with the sort of fairly experimental pullers that I've put in. I don't know how good these are really, especially because I'll be reefed down at night. So that these might be a bit optimistic. We shall see. This is, <laughs> hopefully I'll learn a lot on this passage, which I'll be able to apply to future passages. Yeah, so wind-wise, maximum wind speed according to the ECMWF of 22 knots, uh, maximum gust of 28 knots, minimum of 3.6, so that's going to be towards the start when we're motoring, and an average of 12.8. The GFS is looking much, much nicer, but like I said, I, I don't know if I trust it. So that would be six hours motoring according to the GFS. All of them has barely any time upwind, 2% and 3% and the time is mostly downwind with a little bit of reaching and mostly in 8 to 20 knots, which is kind of ideal really. And again, wave-wise, we're going to spend most of our time in 1 to 2 meter waves with some 2 to 3 meter waves, so again, nothing nothing to worry about too much there. So in preparation for heading off, um, I'm going to do a few engine checks. So I'm going to check the impeller. So I'm glad I checked the impeller because I'm pretty sure one of those little fronds is broken. It is. That's a new impeller, which is a bit annoying, but it could be that I didn't lubricate it up when I put it in. So I'll try it this time with some washing up liquid on it to ease its first few rotations when dry. Yeah, just here. It's just this one's got a little bit of a smile, so might as well change it out, but keep that one for emergency use in case I run out completely. A crazy assortment of impellers. Um, there's this one with extra fronds, which is strange, but uh, these ones that both look better than the one that was in there no cracks or smiles or anything like that so it, it doesn't look new but it well maybe it does look new no problems with it anyway and it's a like for like replacement with the old one so that's what's going to be going in and I have one extra then if this one causes a problem which again doesn't look new but also doesn't look that old it looks unused even though it's not new 
Perfect. Lots of spares. While I have the, the impeller out, I check for wear by wiggling the spine of the um, the pump. What happened to me previously was I was overheating. The impeller was fine. Everything was grand, but this uh, central rotating spine had uh, some play in it. The bearings were kind of gone, so that was what was causing the pump to not pump efficiently, and there wasn't enough raw water coming through. I'll check that now when I have the impeller off. Everything's fine there. So lots of washing up liquid on this to ease its first few rotations. So I'm putting together a grab bag. Um, this would be the bag that I would grab in an emergency situation where I have to abandon ship with very short notice. Um, so all these things on the table are uh, necessary for the grab bag. Some of them are going to go into it and other ones will need to be, they have a use on board um, during the trip so they can't really live in the grab bag. For example, my inReach Mini is going to be used in use constantly for communication so I can't put that into the grab bag. So I have a sort of a routine that I would establish for getting the stuff that's not in the grab bag into the grab bag in an emergency situation. But certain things can live in the grab bag. For example, my uh, personal locator beacon uh, that can live in the grab bag because I'm planning whenever I go on deck to have my inReach on me uh, because it's slightly neater and it has an SOS function as well, similar to the PLB, um, and it'll always be fully charged. Um, other things like the foghorn can go in there, but may need to come out if I need to if I need to signal. Um, other things just can't go in there, like for example the uh, passage chart, because I'm going to be using that on an ongoing basis. Um, so, yeah, there's like a liter and a half of water. It's probably around two days worth of, of food if rationed we could possibly stretch a bit further uh, the signal flare uh, passport ships documentation some money in US dollars uh, handheld radio VHF a knife uh, this can't go in there actually because I'll be using it on an ongoing basis I'll have that on my person at all time um, some candles and some storm matches uh, head torch again cannot go in because I'll, I'll be constantly using that so uh, this is the bag that I'm going to use for it. It's a large waterproof um, bag. My plan is part of my preparation will be to basically do a supermarket sweep of that drawer, the top drawer there, and just take all of the canned food into the bag. The second place that I would do a sweep of um, would be the items that hang here. So my head torch, my EPIRB, my uh, multi-tool, my good knife, um, and the passage planning. And plastic plan obviously will be on the chart table, which is a very nice moment, as will the handbrake compass. Mm -hmm. 